two bits from the Acts of the Apostles, the beginning of the church um, in Acts 2, with the work of the Holy Spirit, and then where we would have got to if it wasn't Pentecost, from Acts 14, um, when the church is in full flood. So Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost came, all the believers were gathered together in one place. Suddenly there was a noise from the sky which sounded like a strong wind blowing, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then they saw what looked like tongues of fire which spread out and touched each person there. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to talk in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, religious men who had come from every country in the world. When they heard this noise, a large crowd gathered. And they were all excited because each one of them heard the believers speaking in his own language. In amazement and wonder, they exclaimed, These people who are talking like this are Galileans. How is it then that all of us hear them speaking in our own native languages? We are from Parthia, Media and Elam, from Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, from Pontus and Asia, from Phrygia and Pamphylia, from Egypt and the regions of Libya near Cyrene. Some of us are from Rome, both Jews and Gentiles converted to Judaism. And some of us are from Crete and Arabia. Yet all of us hear them speaking in our own languages about the great things that God has done. Amazed and confused, they kept asking each other, what does this mean? But others made fun of the believers saying, these people are drunk. And I'm coming and going slightly, am I? Yeah, there's a problem with the radio myself, but you understand. <laughs> I'm not drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Once is enough, isn't it? Um, and then Acts 14, Paul, Paul is in full flood. There have been preaching and riots. And uh, we get to Lystra. In Lystra, there was a man who had been lame from birth and had never been able to walk. He sat there and listened to Paul's words. Paul saw that he believed and could be healed, so he looked straight at him and said in a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. The man jumped up and started walking around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they started shouting in their own language, the gods have become like men and come down to us. And they gave Barnabas the name Zeus and Paul they named Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of the god Zeus, whose temple stood just outside the town, brought bulls and flowers to the gate, for he and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifice to the apostles. When Barnabas and Paul heard what they were about to do, they tore their clothes and ran into the middle of the crowd shouting, why are you doing this? We ourselves are only human beings like you. We are here to announce the good news, to turn you away from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven, earth, sea, and all that is in them. In the past, he allowed all people to go their own way, but he has always given evidence of his existence by the good things he does. He gives you rain from heaven and crops at the right times. He gives you food and fills your hearts with happiness. But even with these words, the apostles could hardly keep the crowd from offering a sacrifice to them. Some Jews came from Antioch in Pisidia and from Iconium. They won the crowd over to their side, stoned Paul, dragged him out of the town, thinking that he was dead. But when the believers gathered round him, he got up, went back into the town, and the next day he and Barnabas went to Derby. As I say, at the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles begins the period of the world in which we now live. Because of the triumph of Jesus on the cross, God's Holy Spirit is amongst us and we can access him if we open our hearts to him. Many of you here are Christians and have been through many Pentecosts. But I would ask you all today, so what is your spiritual state? Jesus said, I come that you should have life in life in all its fullness. 
If you have given your life to Christ, you will have life, but will you have it in all its fullness? You will have been touched by the Spirit, but how open to the Spirit are you? Have you felt in your spiritual life in this past week that you are like someone walking upstairs and holding your breath? The more effort you put in, the more difficult it becomes, and you need to breathe in the Spirit of God. If nothing else this morning, we are here to receive from him his love, his power, his reality, that the supernatural breaks into the normal life that we have and transforms it. And where they experienced this with the wind and the fire, great cosmic visual aid, God wanted them to make sure that they knew exactly what was happening. That was precisely that stirring. God made waves in their lives, quite literally. Nobody said, oh, we're having a prayer meeting. It was pretty nice. <laughs> they don't say that. God makes waves in their lives because God is great, God is powerful, God is loving, God is supernatural, and they are stirred up. And you find even in the, later on in Acts, we've got Paul here. He's been stoned. He's been thrown out of one place. He's going to another. He is all for it. He is totally stirred up for it. Because when God makes waves in their lives, they make waves in the life of the world. And I would encourage you this morning to allow God to make waves in your life. But also that you, through the power of his spirit, should make waves in the community and world in which we live. When I, was, uh, when I had uh, small children, one of the deep joys was going to the swimming baths. Anyway, it wasn't a proper swimming bath. It wasn't a big rectangle smelling of chlorine that you jumped in one end and swam up and down for four lengths and then got out. It was one of these swimming pools, kind of circular thing with pot plants and palm trees and all that stuff, you know. One end, though, there was the children's pool. It was very warm. It was about 18 inches deep. I would go and sit on the bottom. And the children would run around in there, splashing and bouncing up and down and having a great time. God wants to bless us. Let's make no bones about this. God loves each one of us. But to be immersed in the Spirit of God is not a matter of sitting in the shallow end, splashing around. Too often the church is like this. Oh, we had such a nice time. You know? It's safe, it's warm, it's friendly, it's cuddly, it's nice. This is not God making waves. Um, we've seen the pictures in the last few weeks of those terrible fires in, uh, ca in, uh, in Canada on the edge of the prairies there. In a previous life, I, met, uh, I, I visited Edmonton, which is the capital of Alberta, which is a bit to the south of where the fires were. I went there partly because it was said to have the largest indoor shopping mall in the world. Yeah, it was terrible, but <laughs> can you imagine that side? But it was big enough for a small nine-hole golf course down the middle of it. <laughs> but one side of it, it was an enormous water, water sports place because, in fact, we're hundreds and hundreds of miles from the sea. And I looked down through the glass off the balcony. And at one end, there was a wave machine. I mean, an awesome wave machine like this. And at the other end, there was an artificial beach with breakers on it. And in the middle, I kid you not, there was real people doing real surfing <laughs> on the waves. When it comes to God, that is making waves, <laughs> not splashing around in the shallow end. And God, who will make waves in our lives, does this with the early church. I'm always a bit despondent when reading this passage um, of the coming of the Holy Spirit. So exciting, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. And then Luke goes into a, a huge list of all the places in the Middle East. And I'm thinking, what have we got to go through all these for? He wants to say, this is impacting the world, not a few, just a few Christians. Immediately, there's an impact. Immediately, there's a mission thing. Immediately, it's spreading out. And lots of people from different cultures, with different languages, different religions even, not just Jews, but all the hangers on around the edge, they're all listening. This is not, there was a great spiritual experience in an upper room with a few dozen Christians and they came out and said we had a great time. This is immediately impacting the people from all over the place. And fired up these first disciples 
make waves amongst all this lot. That is what we're called to do. We are not going to make any waves in our families, in our society, unless Jesus is making waves in us. You cannot share Jesus if you do not have Jesus. You cannot pray for people to receive the Spirit unless you have the Spirit. But when you are fired up, you are fired up. I think it's the Archbishop of Canterbury said that it's time that the church should overflow with the love of God. You can't overflow unless you're full. Now, you can see here what, what the sort of things that God begins to do in them. They're not just enthusiasts selling things, but God begins to work in them and make waves. He does two things. First of all, he, he gives them the power and the ability and the words to actually get up and say something. We have no evidence that these early Christians were great, great speakers, and yet they get up and say something, and it is very clear what they say. And it is very heard. They talk about Jesus. They don't talk about the church. They don't talk about politics. All of that is impacted, but it says the great things about Jesus. They talk about Jesus being the Son of God, the divine God, the supernatural reality. They talk about the cross of Christ so that men and women can be forgiven and their lives can be changed. They go to the core of it. They don't go to the periphery. The peripheral will come but it's about Jesus and they say it clearly and they stand up and say it. And they say it in a way that can be understood. In, uh, in, 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 at the beginning of Acts, they are given the, the spiritual gift to speak in different languages. We'll come back to that in a minute. But in Acts 14, they speak in a way that they can understand. You see, when, when, um, when Paul was speaking to Jews in synagogues, he begins his addresses with a great review of the Old Testament because they like that sort of thing. They did the Old Testament, you see? So, oh, in times and places, all the Jews are going, yeah, 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 yeah. When he was in Athens and they were all philosophers and intellectuals, he does his big philosophy intellectual bit and they all thought, oh, yeah, very good. Here, however, in Lystra, they are peasants and are probably a non-Greek underclass who only spoke Greek rather badly. So he doesn't do all that you remember in the Old Testament because they didn't know the Old Testament. You, don't rem you know what Plato said. They know the faintest idea what Plato said. What he said is, God has given you your crops. God has given you the sun and the rain and the and the seasons. God has given you the soil. God has made your harvest. Oh, we've got that. Now this God, who has made all this like we were singing about earlier on, now this God has come in Christ to be absolutely face up to you so you know the good news, you see. And they're with him. The word is not just true. The word needs to be communicated in a way that it's said. My, my, one of my daughters said that they're their neighbour started coming to their church and started reading the Bible. And um, she said, I've got to this bit. And she recounted this small passage from the Bible to my daughter in language which was not recognisable as church speak. And I thought, if I had been explaining it to this lady, I would never have used that language, but perhaps I should. You know? To speak clearly, to let it be heard in a way that people can understand. It's no good standing on a soapbox up by the, uh, you know, in the marketplace spouting in authorised version English, all right? Even I can't understand that. If we are going to make waves, we need to speak something about Jesus, like they did. Not quietly, not just inside the church, but on the whole gamut of the way we communicate with people and to speak to them about Jesus in a way they can understand. Not being preachy, you're not being artificial, not being boring, but perhaps it's on Facebook or perhaps it's on other parts of social media. Perhaps we can have a Jesus tweet, you know? Somewhere you say, not I've had a great week, but I really feel I've been blessed this week. Not, I really had to dig in and try hard this week, but I really felt that God helped me this week. It's just what you believe, so why don't we say it? Why aren't we talking about the good news of Jesus in a natural way that people will plug into? Because it is the best news, you know. The Cornishman is full of news. 
All sorts of news, big news, unimportant news, filler news, interesting news, boring news, parochial news, all sorts of people are talking about everything, aren't they? You turn on the media, they just <coughs> talk. Politics, economics, steel production, Brexit, refugees, everything. Why isn't somebody talking about Jesus? It's the crucial thing. You know, it doesn't even get onto page five of the paper, you know. But here, absolutely front news. This is the big thing happened. In that town, on that day, it's Jesus and the good news of God. There's lots of other things. There would have been Romans and Greeks and the problem of the price of wheat and, you know, Roman taxes. Lots of other things you could talk about. But let's talk about the big thing about Jesus Christ. The best news. Not only did they talk in a way that they can hear, but they did stuff as well. It says in um, Acts 14, it says here, Acts 14, 3, they were speaking boldly about the Lord who proved that their message about his grace was true by giving them the power to perform miracles and wonders. God is a supernatural God. He doesn't just give us supernatural words, but he does supernatural stuff. And so they had this amazing gift at the beginning with all these people with these different languages that they all heard them in their own language. This is not um, spiritual speaking as we might use it in worship today, but it's a gift and it happens from mission as happened since, where somebody is amazingly given the gift of another language so that the people can hear it. We read that they were amazed about two things then. They were amazed what they heard, and they were amazed that they heard it. <laughs> you know? we had some, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had some visitors from, uh, the, 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 from Holland. And afterwards they said, kind of with a Dutch accent, oh, we really enjoyed the sermon and we, we understood most of it. <laughs> That's fantastic. If I'd been in Holland, I wouldn't have understood any of it. They were, you know, but... <laughs> But what's the good of saying it if you can't understand it, you know? They are amazed. They heard the word of God in their own language. So that God does supernatural activity with the word. And then when we get to, uh, when we get to Lystra, Paul is not starting a new health service. Paul is just looking for a sign. He sees this man who's a believer, he's lame, he says, get up and walk. And there's a miracle, extraordinary. And they are all amazed at that. That really catches their attention. You know, I think we're called not just to be men and women of words, but neither are we just called to be men and women of good works. You know, we visit the sick and take them flowers and look after the poor. It's important, but it's not supernatural. But in our prayers, if we're going to be like the early church, we need to pray small prayers that make a difference. We need to pray for people to be better. We need to pray for some guidance. We need to pray for some help. And people notice when things happen. And you think, how did that happen? Well, that was God. Really? I didn't believe in God, but he's just done it. It's a real crosser of the line. There have been things in my life where God has done little things and I realized I didn't believe in that much. And I think, oh, I'm really sorry. And it doesn't have to be drama. It doesn't have to be, you know, Krakatoa erupting. It can just be the thing that you needed, the touch of God on your life in a small thing in your everyday. And you think the furniture moved at this point. It was not quite the same. Wow. The word and the action. We need to be a place where things happen rather than just things are said. Where lives are changed rather than opinions are just changed. And then we see the result. Well, the result is pretty dramatic, isn't it? The result is of what they say that people hear is immediate discussion, debate, disagreement, row, argument, and riot. It's a great result. It's never happened here with what I've said. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, nobody, I've never done a sermon where people are throwing the chairs apart and walking out and all this sort of thing. It would be very biblical if they did. They don't need to do that now. <laughs> but immediately I'm downgrading it to words rather than actions, you see. I want you to believe you, but you want, I want you to believe me, but I don't want you to do it, you see. 
But what happens is not so much that they are difficult or preachy. It's not that they're falling out with people. But some of the people are hearing this and believing it and some of them aren't. And they fall out with one another. Yeah, we're supposed to be peacemakers, but we're supposed to be true speakers. If we speak the truth, people don't always like the truth. There are bad things going on out there in our world. The devil might have been beaten, but that doesn't mean it's all nice. You've only got to look on the news, whether it's refugees or whether it's a decline in, in morality in society, whether it's people being broken in their families and whatever. You think, it's just terrible. It's all, a lot of it, and I'm an, I'm an optimist, but a lot of it is bad stuff. The fact is that when we make waves, when they make waves, it comes up against something that doesn't believe this stuff. It doesn't believe it. It doesn't like it. There is conflict. When the Methodists built their chapels in Cornwall, they were not popular because of what they said and because of their lifestyle. They were very controversial. People didn't like it. We as the churches have always got this feeling now, oh, we ought to be nice. Everybody ought to love us. This is not how it is here. You say to Paul, how is it going? Oh, it's really good yesterday. I got stoned almost to death. <laughs> you know, did everybody like it? No, they didn't. There was controversy and, you know, it was a riot. You can imagine if I had a riot down here, you can imagine the authorities would come and say, what's going on? Hey, what about if somebody said, what's going on? <laughs> you see? Hmm. And then with, these, um, with, this, um, with this miracle, when he heals this, heals this guy, you think this is a bit weird. <coughs> the priest turns up, you know, of the, the pagan priest comes, turns up to sacrifice the bull. And you can see it all with the priest and the robes. The bull looking a bit apprehensive. <laughs> and, and what has that got to do with us? The fact is that when we actually begin to engage in spiritual activity and miracles happen and people's thing, people's lives are changed, we are into the whole spirituality area. Our words are going to confront secularism, but our actions will confront the new age. Penzance is not just full of people who don't believe anything, it's also full of people who believe in fairies at the bottom of the garden. We have so much new age, so much um, the, of the occult, so much of pre-Christian Cornish sort of identity, pagan identity. But as soon as you get into doing stuff, people say, oh, they're weird down there, things are happening. And then people say, oh, I got a crystal, can I bring it, you know. You're into all that huge area that people are floundering around in because they want to believe something and it's being exploited by the powers of evil. And you're mixing it, just as he is with this old priest here and the bull. And they say, we don't want to be in this, but they are in it because they healed the man. We are into all that spirituality area which the world is full of at the moment and getting seriously wrong. And, of course, this, this priest is the priest of uh, somebody else, isn't he? Some, some god, anyway. You're going to get into all sort of interfaith stuff. As soon as you start making waves, put a whole thing together, and it's a riot. And I would just encourage you with this, really, to make waves. To allow Jesus to make waves in your life. Because if you believe that what is wrong in your life needs to go, you need the Spirit to heal you and cleanse you and reform you. But if you believe that what is wrong in our society, without being miserable and draconian, if you believe that whether it is in refugee camps, the camps, whether it's the persecution of Christians across so much of the world, whether it is children who are starving and terrorized, whether it is terrible governance in so much of the world, whether it's our divided society and our bickering and our politics, and whether you think it is the whole problem of integrity in life, whether it is the assault on the family or the latest assault on human gender, whether it is you feel it's the occult, whatever it is, are we going to make waves in it? Are we going to make waves so that when we're drinking coffee with some people, there is an argument about the truth? Are we prepared to be slated on Facebook because we happen to say something about Jesus? Is the church got problems out there 
somebody might break our stained glass windows. Huh? Or might you prepare to lose the old friend or gain a friend or find your friends fall out about what you said? Am I prepared for somebody to write one of those lovely affirmative letters they do to the Cornishman about me? I could do without it. It's making waves. And at the end of this story in Luke, in in Acts 14, what do we find? Does everybody believe? No. Is everybody convinced? No. But some of them are. There is a church in Lystra where nobody believed before. And Paul pulls himself together, gets prayed for, dusts himself off, and goes on to form another church. Wow. That's why we're here. This morning, let's not just say, oh, Holy Spirit, come on me afresh, with the visions of the paddling pool. Hmm? Lord, make waves in my life that I should make waves in the life of the community. We're We're soon going to celebrate the reopening of the Jubilee Pool, aren't we? It's lovely, I'm sure. Do you want to be in the Jubilee Pool or do you want to be in the sea? Hmm? Does the church want to be with me in the Jubilee Pool and my kayak paddling around the Jubilee Pool and you're all clapping on the edge? Or are we all going to be in the waves and me capsizing in the sea? I want to be out there. You know, we'll be out there. We want to be out there.